welcome to The Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. As we read our way through the Aubrey Matra novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, this is a big week for us, even though it's not a big chapter. Remind us, please, would you, where we were before and where we might be coming to in this chapter. Oh, thanks, Ian. Well, I I can answer both of those questions. Where we were and where we're coming to is tip of the knife edge. Um, Boy, we are. The tension is right there. So last time in Chapter 10, the Polycrest went to the Baltic while Stephen entertained Diana and Mm -hmm. visited Sophie before heading off on a secret mission to Spain. Now, despite their best advice to each other, Sophie won't go see Jack despite Stephen's suggestion, and Stephen won't make an offer of marriage to Diana. Hennage Dundas asks Stephen to tell Jack that he's ruining his career by spending so much time in Dover. And we translate that as Stephen does, and as the Admiral does, and seeing Diana. So morale turns out when they've gotten back from the Baltic has deteriorated even further on the Polycrest. Jack looks terrible. He's beset by bad dreams and a very grouchy disposition. (laughs) Stephen tries to deliver Hennage's message. Jack took it badly, called Stephen a bastard and a liar. And essentially, as as you so rightly pointed out last episode with the code, forced a duel between the two of them. Jack spied on Diana and learned that she was seeing Canning, not Stephen, as he suspected, Stephen, in the meantime, was practicing his deadly pistol shooting, preparing for the duel. Hart, at the last minute, ordered Polycrest on a suicide mission to the treacherous port of Chalier. And right before the duel, they took off. This time, Chapter 11, amid high tension between Jack and Stephen, Stephen makes a momentous decision and Jack does not. Right. Circumstances force Jack to step up in his leadership role. Jack tries to sell the crew on this mission. Everything goes well until it doesn't. Things get crazy and Jack goes for broke until things actually break and end up in a large pool of blood. Oh, my gosh. Mike, this is one of those chapters that's going to get everybody talking and uh, we can't wait to get into it. Great. Right. We open in the sick bay of the Polycrest, and Stephen overhears an Irishman telling a shipmate in Irish that, in his words, the doctor is all right. The doctor won't see as abused. The doctor is for liberty, speaks French, he is Irish. These are all attributes that mean that they're presuming that Stephen's going to be on their side. Stephen recognizes this straight away for what it is. He leaves the sick bay, requests a meeting straight away with the captain. He gets a disrespectful response from little Parslow, he who got drunk a few chapters ago. But Babington takes care of stuff. He kicks Parslow down the ladder and delivers the message himself. As the carpenter leaves then, Stephen is next in the cabin to see Captain Aubrey. And on the table there, between them, he sees this lump of rotten wood with a drawn bolt, one of these robber bolts that Jack had already told Stephen about. And Jack there with what we see as a shattered, bludgeoned, look on his face. So this is a, already an uncomfortable day, a miserable day for Jack, and Stephen's not going to make it any better. Jack gets to his feet. He has this awkward, doubtful, embarrassed look. His head is bent under the beam. And Stephen says, I'm sorry to have to ask for this interview, sir. And then goes on to tell Jack about what he thinks is a potential mutiny due to happen tomorrow night with the intention he thinks that the crew would then carry the ship into a french port this actually is not completely surprising to jack he says this confirms my suspicions he'd noticed a downcast sophie's he'd noticed 24 pound shot missing from the rack for shot rolling in the night watches and asks Stephen a follow-up question which is can you tell me who the ringleaders are Stephen says well you can be called many things but not an informer he thinks he's already said more than enough. Um, and Mike, this is important for a few different reasons. We know that Stephen has at least sympathized with, you might even say supported, mutineers and rebels on a number of different occasions in this book. And of course, we heard about the same um, in Master and Commander as well. Maybe now his love for Jack, his love for his friend, 
the friend that he's nonetheless in a, in a challenge and dual situation with. That love has risen above his own ideas of liberty and equality, despite all of the cruel and barbarous punishment that he's witnessed, despite all the protests that he's had to raise and all the antagonism that he's raised between himself and Jack and Parker. And Jack has his own reflection here about the potential role of Stephen, not as Stephen, but also as a surgeon. More than half of the fleet surgeons in big fleet mutinies have been in sympathy with mutineers. And Jack has a moment here to remember that even Killick and Bonden, who must have known something about this forthcoming mutiny, had not informed on their shipmates, even though they were very close followers of Jack Aubrey. And Mike, th- th- this is a really big moment for Stephen, I think. He's not just doing his duty as a warrant officer, right? He's doing something m- more fundamental to help people more than just himself. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as, as you and I were talking earlier, Ian, that, that maybe Stephen's act goes beyond merely helping the captain, fulfilling yeah. his duty, like you say, as a warrant officer. You know, in a way, he's also helping the mutineers. He knows from his past experience of the Irish Rising in 1798, what happens to people who go along with a rebellion that eventually gets put down? Right. You know, so, you know, he could see a lot of his Gaelic speaking friends uh, hanging from a rope before this is all over. Yep. And he's also helping his friend. Maybe a part of him even knows that this could present a chance for Jack to once again be his true self yeah. rather than this version of Captain Aubrey that we've seen in some of these more recent chapters here. Oh, I, I think it's right. And I think it's a really great decision point for Stephen. And it carries a lot of weight for him. And we'll talk about the consequences later on in the in the chapter. But it also has really brutal consequences for Jack Aubrey. And uh, how, how does he take it? Well, that's the thing. I mean, this is what I was waiting for. He was like, okay, Stephen's stepping up. Now, finally, we got, you know, this chance. Yeah. And Jack says, thank you for telling me very stiffly. Yeah. And that's it. Stephen leaves. And and the text, I I should love, text reads, when the door had closed behind Stephen, he sat down, he being Jack, sat down with his head in his hands and let himself go to total unhappiness, to something near despair. So many things together. And now this cold, evil look, he reproached himself most bitterly for not having seized this chance for an apology. And this is Jack speaking to himself. He says, if only I could have got it out. But he spoke so quick and and he was so very cold, though, indeed, I should have looked the same if any man had given me the lie. It is not to be born. What in God's name possessed me so trivial, so beside the point, as gross as a schoolboy calling names unmanly. Mm. However, he shall make a hole in me whenever he chooses. And then again, what, should I have the air of suddenly growing abject now that I know he's such a deadly old file? And, oh, this is just, oh my God, Jack, you know, you're you're apologizing here. If you'd just done this to Stephen, we could put this behind us here. But then, and and seeing Jack wrap himself up again in these, all these emotions, like knowing what I did was so stupid. It was all me. Oh, but wait, if I back out now, is it? You know, people are going to think that it's because I'm afraid that Matron's such a deadly shot. I don't know. So, so many times in this book, we see people who, who you know, just can't get themselves out of their own way and right. risk ending up in their own misery instead of se- seizing happiness or something like it. So, I, I don't know. I, I know Stephen hasn't heard the apology. The universe has heard it, and I hope maybe yeah. that counts for something here in the cosmic unconscious. I hope Stephen's getting a little resonance. Right. Well, it's. This then is going to become a chapter of decisions and action by Jack Aubrey. And all of what's happened in the previous chapters, I think, leads him to the decisions that he makes now for for, yeah. for good and potentially for ill. Some of them very natural decisions for Jack Aubrey. Some of them fraught with incredible danger. And maybe part of this is him telling the universe, even if he can't tell Stephen, what, what he thinks of himself and his conduct. Nice. He gets straight to it then. We get, we get Jack in leadership mode he calls for mr smithers smithers the privileged posh uh, aggressive nasty uh, marine officer that stephen beat at cards a chapter or two ago 
Jack wishes that McDonald were there. He's an officer-like man. Even though McDonald disapproves of Jack, he thinks he would have been a far superior person to lean on in this situation than this puppy Smithers. Jack asks Smithers to think carefully about each of the Marines under his command and whether or not each of these men is to be relied upon. And Smithers says, well, yes, of course they are. They're like bluster. But Jack says, no, no, no. Think carefully about this man. Reply when you've really thought it through. He says, this is a matter of the very first consequence. And remember, we've had this hinted to us and reminded to us a few times already. One of the roles of Royal Marines aboard a Navy ship is to be personal security for the captain and the officers. Right. Jack is giving Smithers this savage, penetrating stare, and at least it penetrates something of Smithers' bluster and arrogance as he stops and thinks. And he says, on reflection, all of my men are reliable except for one who is Irish. He's a papist. (laughs) You know, fortunate or unfortunate little coincidence there. And Jack asks if Smithers is dead certain saying that, Smithers, you will answer for your reply. And by the way, as as I'm reading that one of these Marines is an Irish-speaking papist, I wonder if that was one of the people that Stephen had overheard in the sick bay. But never mind. It's interesting to to speculate. Nice. So Smithers is dismissed, and in comes Goodridge, the master. Remember, we finished the last chapter with Goodridge laying out for Stephen the tricky approach and navigation and pilotage associated with getting into this harbour, Cholier. Jack says, tell me our exact position. Could we, rather than go a day and a tide, can we go in one tide? Can we get to show you on the evening tide tonight instead of tomorrow? Maybe, maybe just, says the master. So Jack calls for a press of sail, which is the the old Jack Aubrey crack on till all sneers maneuver. We get exactly that. The polycrest flies every single stitch of canvas. And he sends for the first lieutenant, Mr. Parker. As he tells Parker about this mutiny, He tells him also that he intends to take Polycrest into action as quickly as possible by way of dealing with the mutiny and says, I'm going to talk to the men. After the gunner loads the two aftermost guns with grape, back to personal security for the officers here, and the officers assemble on the quarter deck at six bells, which is 11 a.m. to you and me. That's in about 10 minutes after Jack's had this interview with Parker. So this is all happening really, really quickly. He's also ordering that the Marines should fall in with their muskets on the forecastle. So the crew, as they gather in the waist, are going to be faced by grape-loaded cannon pointing at them from the quarter deck and muskets pointing at them from the forecastle. So Jack is not betting everything on his own charisma here. He knows that he needs to take prudent action to keep himself um, on the side of safety. There is, he orders Parker, to be no hurry, no concern beforehand, the guns are going to be turned forward with an old stir by each one only when the hands are called. No man, this is the important bit for Parker, no man is to be struck or started until further orders. And my, I, I was wondering as I got to this point in the text, how is Parker going to reply? I can imagine Parker kind of going off on one uh, about the mutiny, but it seems like Jack has got him sort of under control here. Yeah, it's really nice because Parker says, you know, may, may I offer a word of advice? And Jack says, no, no. Right. And Jack just cuts him off. And in Jack's own mind, he's thinking, you know, this is my lone responsibility as captain of the ship. And he also thinks, and because I'm the one who knows best here, because I served before the mast as a disrated midshipman. So he says, you know, he's seen this situation. This is him to himself from the other side. And he has great affection for the four mass jacks, these guys that he lived with for quite some time. And he knows, Parker certainly doesn't know what will and won't go with the lower deck. And so he's thinking, you know, I don't need your advice because you have no idea what you're talking about. And I know better. I need to, I need to handle this. And, and, and he does, he, you know, as you said, we were 10 minutes away Quickly, the men are assembled and Jack starts very clearly. He says, you know, he knows damn well what's going on and he won't have it. Um, The text reads, what simple fellows you are to listen to a parcel of making clever sea lawyers and politicians, glib, quick talking coves. Some of you have put your necks into the noose. Mm -hmm. Jack says, you know, you see that man of war right there on the horizon. If I signal him or any other cruiser, those men are going to be run up to the yard arm with the rogues march playing. 
He says, but I'm not going to signal because the polycrest is going into action tonight. And I'm not going to have anyone in the fleet say that any polycrest is afraid of hard knocks. And Joe Place can't help himself. You know, this is Jack being Jack. Poly, you know, Place jumps in and says, that's right. And another voice, you know, deeper in the crowd says, it's not you, sir. It's him, old Parker, the hard horse bugger. <laughs> it's a really great moment. Jack's not done yet, but I really like this moment. He's chosen to very, very quickly address the mutiny right up front in what he says. And then he turns the men's attention to action and to something that they can all align on, which is their own perception of their own courage. It's, it's really great rhetoric, but it's also really, really great leadership. Um, he's not relying on their patriotism. He's not relying on anything other than we are together. There's an enemy over there. We have to go take care of it. Follow me. And th this is this is better than any amount of jingoism, I, th I think. I agree. He does mention the enemy. He says the French are over there in Chaulieu. We're going to hammer them in their own port. Any man afraid of hard knocks, he says, had better stay behind. Is there indeed any man here afraid of hard knocks? There's a universal, not ill-natured growl. So he's judged the mood of the men really well. He's found a question that he can ask them to which the answer is yes, which was a really, really smart rhetorical trick again. Love it. He's glad, he says, that there isn't any man here who's afraid of hard knocks. He says people may say we're not very quick in stays, that polycrest don't fill their top cells all that pretty. But if they say she's shy, if they say she don't like hard knocks, well, black's the white of my eye. And he recalls the past for them. He reminds them not about all the difficulties and the awkwardnesses and the slow sail handling and the you know shaky timbers. He reminds them of their time in action. Every man there, he says, did his duty like a lion when we thumped it into the billon. That's the way that we'll hammer bone apart and bring the war to an end. Not, he says, by listening to a set of galley rangers and clever chaps. And I, I think he does a really nice job appealing to their courage and their seamanship, not to high-flown political ideals, not to loyalty, not to king and country. And I think for a bunch of people who are on the, on the verge of mutiny, he found the one way that I think he could try and align them. It's a really great speech. It's a really great moment. And I'm sure it's the kind of thing that Stephen would have hoped <laughs> to have yes. triggered Jack when he, yeah. when he called out the mutiny earlier on. Yeah. And, and Jack takes it a step higher. He tells him, I give you my word, there's going to be no punishment over this. There's not even going to be an entry in the log. But, he says, every man needs to do his duty tonight because Chalier is a very tough nut to crack. It's got awkward shoals. It's got an awkward tide. Every hand to his rope and haul with a will, the text says, quicks the word and sharps the action. And I think, you know, for those of you who've been listening to us for a long time, that's our Russell Crowe alert means, ah, here's a line that got picked up in the movie, you know, that, you know, appeared in a different book than supposed, I don't know which book the movie was exactly. It was yeah, lots exactly. of them together. But yeah, here's this one. I remember that. Well, he says, now, I'm going to pick some men for the barge before we crowd on the rest of the sail. And he walks into the crowd unarmed. And I thought this is another great yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, we got the Marines, we got the cannons, but here you go. I'm right here amongst you because I'm one of you. And he's been demonstrating this in little ways, that, you know, with how he's interacting with ropes and stuff in, in the midst of all this. And he starts scanning their faces and he listens to all of a sudden this low buzz of talk and whispers accelerating like, uh oh, what's what's this here? And he tells Davis to get into the barge. And Davis, you know, the text says his eyes look like a frightened wild beast, clearly one of the ringleaders here. Um, and Jack doesn't, you know, Jack's thinking himself, you know, I don't want to have this speech go over and then have these guys go to dinner with their messmates and try some desperate, you know, foolery here. And then he says, you know, you Wilcox, Anderson, Johnson into the barge. And now Jack feels the tension raising. It's like, uh oh, he's picking out all the top troublemakers and he's putting them in this barge. Is he going to cut them loose? Is he going to yeah. you know, shoot this thing down? And as he feels that tension get right to the highest point, he says, bonded into the barge. 
and bondage, you know, okay, me, sir, me, sir. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's almost piteous in that. Jack says, cut along now. Bantock, Lakey, Screech. And all of a sudden, whoa, everybody said, what, what, you know, all of these men could not be suspected by anybody. And they're all heading into the barge too. They're thinking, well, this can't be punishment. He's not going to kill all his friends and supporters in that thing. And so Jack, once again, just playing this brilliantly. Just brilliantly here. Oh, it's great. Now, I can't really tell, in terms of how you'd prepare a ship like this to go into action, I can't tell what the real pretext reason would have been for putting these men in the barge and have them tow behind. But it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's a really smart way to make use of time and space to get these people, like we said, away from their messmates so that they can be seen as... You know, being brought back into the fold. Meanwhile, we get something that Jack Aubrey does often in heavy weather, but now we're seeing him do in very calm weather. He's cracking on with every stitch of canvas in the uh, in the inventory. The sooner we get there, he says, the sooner we're home. Top men and upper yard men, are you ready? Ready, sir. Are you ready, they say. And the polycrest blooms like a white rose. It's a very, very beautiful image. We see the studding sails, these brand new royals, these sky sails that have never seen the light of day, twinkling, pale in the sun. And Mike, you and I were talking about this. It's a very beautiful moment because there's going to be a matching flower simile later in the chapter. So as we sometimes like to say, stick a pin, stick a horticultural pin in the idea of polycrest as a flower. And off we go. We get the, the signifiers of a ship moving quickly under sail that we've always loved in these books. Um, she plunges her forefoot deep while behind her, the barge races along in her wake, the water almost up to its gunwales. For what practical reason besides containing the mutineers, I have no idea. But it's a very compelling image. And I bet, bet Bolden was a little bit nervous. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, now, because we're now on this deadline, we're basically trying to gain a day on a sailing trip across the channel. We're moving at incredible speed. Polycrest races down the channel like her life depends on it, because guess what? Her life does depend on it. The carpenter comes up to register his protest about how much water she's making in the well. And by the way, her tendency to make water is something that Jack had already mentioned to Admiral Hart in the previous chapter. Even so, on the quarterdeck, we get this little moment of Jack and his feeling towards the Polycrest. He could almost have loved her which is very touching when you consider all the reasons that he's got to detest her, the way that he was put in command of her, all the different things about her that have held him back from doing the things that he needs to do. But he kind of loves her for the way that she is performing now. There's no starting. There's no physical punishment of the crew. No one, though, moves any slower because of it. And the men in the barge are brought back aboard. Thank heavens that Bond didn't fall out. The men in the barge get to not be towed under. And they eat their dinner now as a group in the galley, not with their messmates. A really, really smart move again, just to keep the little social groupings apart from each other for an extra half an hour. And Jack can see that the shipmates of those instigators are now avoiding eye contact, avoiding their society. The seamen, it says, the seamen for the most part had turned with their usual calm volatility from one disaster to the interval before the next. Mike, I, I love that sentence. Um, that might even be a motto. That's gonna, I'm going to get a T-shirt that says, calm volatility, moving from one disaster to the interval before the next. That's, that's life. It did the truth. Right. Well, they finally, they made their move across the channel. They're coming into the port surrounded by fog in a luminous moonlight, long cleared for action and only a little late for their tide. The master takes the con and pilots them in. And, and he's, you know, you're hearing the depth being checked constantly, checking the, you know, the composition below them. And the master is, is reciting to Jack all the familiar points that he sees or senses in the fog. And, and Jack is thinking to himself how he admires the knowledge of these old channel pilots like the master. And there's a, a slight tear in the fog. And the master points out, ah, look, there's Saint-Jacques. You know, here's that fort a mile and a half ahead, and Jack congratulates him. He's, you know, he's like so thrilled that in the midst of all this, they're making it in, they're kind of disguised, they're right where they want to be. And then the lookout calls eight or nine sail on the larboard beam. 
the master says, ah, the ships will be at the far end of the outer road, which is where we are now. And Jack sees his prey, all these transports, these cannoneers, you know, ready for the invasion here. <laughs> and th this is a spoiler, but only about uh, only a couple of paragraphs. S something's about to happen, and we're being given all these little signals that says the master is pretty sure of himself. But by the way, Mike, we never got a conversation between Jack and the master. We heard the master lay out his approach plan to Stephen. We didn't hear him lay it out to Jack. Like, I don't think they're working blind. Jack clearly knows the layout of the harbour. But the master's got his own kind of hubris here by his confidence in navigation. And anybody who's ever tried to navigate a boat in poor visibility or at night knows that you should be completely sceptical of yourself anytime you point to a flashing light and go, yeah, I'm sure that is light X. Because 50% of the time, it's not. And I, I love the fact that the master is given and warmly welcomes the chance to state absolute truth, what he thinks of absolute confidence about his his knowledge of where we are. Are you happy? Says Jack. Th those ships over there, those enemy ships are in the outer road. The master says, he is, he says, they're in the outer road. And he he says, there's nothing but open water between us and them. And none of these statements is going to turn out to be true. Anyhow, Jack thinks, okay, I trust the master. I trust his pilotage. He orders the helm down and runs fast, pretty much inshore, almost due south, towards these gun vessels. And he's getting the guns ready to fire both sides. Once the element of surprise is lost, he knows that all hell is going to break loose from these big batteries on Saint-Jacques and on Convention. His men at that time won't be as steady as they are now. And Jack is about to give them their kind of steadiness orders. He says, not a gun till... And then... Jack and everyone is thrown to the deck as the polycrest runs full tilt onto the West Anvil as the fog clears. They had mistaken convention for San Jack. They had mistaken the inner road for the outer road. The master was mistaken when he said, there's nothing but open water between us and them. There is an impassable spit of sand, the West and the East Anvil sandbanks, between the polycrest, now aground, and the ships that she was sailing towards inshore in the inner road. And Mike, with, with a quick burst of dum, dum, dum. And now we're really having fun, right? Right, right. I'll tell you what, this is, this, is, this is wearing me out, but this is just the kind of cliffhanger where it's time for a break. You know, we'll be right back. Go grab something to settle your nerves because it's going to ratchet up from here. Excellent. If you're enjoying the podcast, please come and join our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash lovers hole. Welcome back from the break. I'm sure you haven't forgotten that we are with Jack and Stephen and the crew of the Polycrest aground on the West Anvil outside of Cholieu. It's a navigational catastrophe and it's a command puzzle for Jack Aubrey. How is he going to keep his crew safe? How is he going to achieve his mission? How is he going to keep Admiral Hart off his back? All of these considerations to one side. He quickly goes about making sure the ship is secure. He orders up sheets, that is to say, take in the sail. And he orders all the guns aft, hoping to break the suction underneath the, the forefoot of the ship. That might bring them off. On the other side, we can see that these ships in the inner road are getting underway, sailing off in every direction. There are two gun brigs from among them who are coming up towards the Polycrest who mean to rake her from stern to stern. And Mike, I, I think you and I both looked twice at that. To rake her from stern to stern? Surely you mean from stem to stern. But that's a funny joke, right? It's a clever little point that the Polycrest is a, is a two-headed sea creature. She has two sterns. <laughs> so anyhow, Jack orders steady fire to be kept up on these gun brigs while he tries to make the best of this really terrible situation here. The moon shines out as the wind clears the smoke and Jack sees both batteries and the whole inner road crowded with shipping and a Corvette moored right up under the guns of convention. And Jack thinks it's a damn full place to moor her. And the public rests are all showing great discipline. They're moving guns aft with little concern for the Fort's thunder. You know, they're now under fire. St. Jacques fires wide, is, is afraid of hitting their own people 
And convention hasn't really gotten the range yet. Jack orders everyone aft. You know, so they move the guns. They're all going to jump at once, hoping that between their weight and jumping and the guns, that they'll slide off into deep water. But it doesn't work. And now at 9.15 p.m., there's very little left of the flood. Jack orders all the boats over the side. Wow. Now, this isn't just about lightning ship. He's also thinking about his tactical options. He's thinking that these boats can pull the polycrest off by taking a bower anchor out into deep water, dropping it, and heaving in on the capstan. They are going to need, though, to cut out a much larger vessel to bear all of that weight. A cannonball passes within a few feet of Jack. The wind of it makes him stagger. And he sees this corvette, the Fanchula, under Convention's guns, 50 feet from the shore. And he thinks, well, we need something bigger for weight, basically as a, as a point of purchase for this pulling off of the sandbank here. Why not cut her out? It's an enormous risk, but no more of a risk than remaining under the fire, under the crossfire from these two forts once they get the range. If he had the corvette in his possession, he wouldn't need the anchor to pull the polycrest off. He could do it with the ship. So he orders one of the petty officers, Russell, to take the barge and draw the fire of the gun brigs, making all the noise that they can, singing out and shouting out. He orders Parker to stay with the polycrest and asks for some volunteers to follow him and cut out the corvette. And Mike, there are some emotional um, high points in this chapter. One of them for me is his realisation of how many men are following him. Cutlasses. Pistols and boarding axes are served out. Smithers takes the marines in the red cutter. Pullings takes the men. He picks men to go in the blue cutter. And Jack asks everyone to come with him. And he's watching all these men tumble down into the boats. 60, 70, 80. Mm -hmm. And given where we were at the beginning of that chapter, that, oh, I feel fantastic when I read that, read that. There's a magnificent rise in Jack's heart and all of the blackness falls clear away. Partly because this is Jack Aubrey in action at his best partly because he knows he's got the body of the crew behind him now. Jack has Bond and go over the bank straight at the Corvette. A blast from convention behind them takes away the polycrest for topmast. And Jack thinks, no great loss. So it's fascinating to me that a moment ago he could almost love her. Now he's thinking, yeah, for topmast, no great loss. But they scrape once there in his gig as they're going over the sand, but then they're across and they head for the Corvette. And Jack's realizing, oh my gosh, you know, the Corvette's likely to have 200 men or more and they're half a mile away. But he's thinking, okay, we, you know, we can count on surprise. Nobody who is moored under their guns expects to be boarded from a grounded ship, you know, so far yeah. off. Jack knows that the fort also cannot depress its guns far enough to fire closer than two to 300 yards in front of the fort. So he's got a wide space once he gets within that range to get to the ship and not be fired on by the fort. The men are grunting and pulling like maniacs. But the boat, to your point, it is so full. You know, basically, most of the crew is now down into one of these three boats, and most of them, I think, with Jack, that the men can barely stretch out their oars. So they're trying to row, but there's just hardly any room to do it. To it's a nice counterpoint, isn't it, to earlier on when he was thinking, "I'm going to put some people in the barge as as a way of kind of carving them out and separating them." Now, being in the barge, being in the boat with Captain Aubrey is the sign of being in in with the. Uh, the main body of the crew here. Anyhow, they're pulling in shore and 400 yards away from the corvette, they notice that the ship herself and the fort on convention have awoken to the danger. There's musketry from the ship and shore. Convention tries to hit the polycrest boats, misses by just a little. The polycrest barge keeps banging away. She's carrying a six-pounder carronade. They're roaring and firing muskets, diverting attention from the other boats silently rushing towards the Fanchula. 200 yards and the three boats split up. There's a burst of fire and a great roaring as the marines board over the bows. Smithers and his men doing, doing a great job by Jack here. Bonden arrives at the mizzen chains. Bonden, who was in the boat with the mutineers uh, a little while ago. Jack himself now leaps up. There's no boarding netting. There are men thrusting all around him. One of them grabs his hair and as he goes over the rail, his sword is out and his pistol in his hand. He shouts, Polycrest, Polycrest, which is the rallying call that he gave us when he was 
um, out out on the roof of the uh, of the inn when he was being chased by the tipstaffs at the beginning of the book. He runs at a swarm of officers. There's extreme violence all around. He fires his pistol at one man, throws it into the next man's face. Babington beside him runs into the flash and smoke of a musket and goes down. Jack stops, stands over Babington, lunges and deflects a plunging bayonet into the deck that would have taken the life of Babington. He takes the soldier's head half off with his heavy sword. Now there's a little officer sword fighting with Jack. Jack gets this burning stab in his shoulder, but before the officer can recover his point, Jack crashes the pommel of his sword into the officer's chest and kicks out his legs from under him. Jack tells him to surrender and he gives up, giving his parole. Mike, Jack is in the thick of it here. What's happening with the rest of the crew? Well, it's, it's, it's a great question, Ian. There's, there's firing, there's crashing, there's shouting in the bowels of the ship. And, you know, in the waist, uh, pulleys is up over the side and he and his team are hacking at the cable. So trying to cut the Fanchula free and then tend to her sails here. The meanwhile, the Redcoats, all the Marines, have cleared the starboard gangway, and everywhere there are shouts of polycrest, polycrest. So, you know, they've come aboard in three different places. They're running across, around the ship. Now, Jack races towards a tight group of officers standing by the mainmast and, you know, attempting to fight while their men behind them, the officers can see, are dropping by the score into the water, into the boats, and getting the heck out of Dodge, as we say here. Sorry. That's a Western metaphor. <laughs> uh, uh, Haynes and others from the Polycrest are going aloft. And then Pullings shows up on the quarterdeck with a bloody axe. And Smithers reaches the quarterdeck as the topsails let fall. And there are men at all the sheets. So an amazing coordinated uh, cutting out expedition so far. And we're back again with Jack. Right. In bad French, having taken care of one officer, Jack then hollers at the French captain, stop the flow of blood, give up, your men have deserted. The captain replies, jamais, never, and makes a furious lunge at Jack. Jack tells Bondon, who's on hand, of course, to trip up his heels as he parries his thrust. Bondon runs under, collars the captain, and the whole thing is over. Now, we've got the Master Goodridge at the wheel, shouting like thunder as the land recedes behind them. Remember, they're aboard the Fanchola. They're in the inner road under convention. Their real aim here is now going to be to go and take care of the Polycrest. Jack wonders where the heck Goodridge had come from. He sends all the French officers below, takes their swords, hands them to Bondon. This, this is kind of a nice little Nelson-like moment, yeah, <laughs> which we've talked about before. They head west, they stay inshore, they go around the tail of the west anvil where they can tack then to reach the polycrest. That takes them out towards Saint-Jacques. So now Convention is firing, I think Saint-Jacques is going to be firing again soon. All of their shots are missing except for one ball that passes through all three topsails. And the polycrest will call out to Jack in tearing great spirits, some of them quite beside themselves. Jack takes a look around his new command, the Fanchula. She's actually broader than the Polycrest. She has 20 guns. She, she is indeed, as we've been calling her, the Fanchula. He wonders why Fort Saint-Jacques hasn't yet opened fire, and he realises that they think that the Fanchula is still in French hands and is attacking the Polycrest. They finally get wind of it at 11pm. Uh, Saint-Jacques starts firing in her own right. Little Parslow runs across the deck to tell Jack that he'd killed a Frenchman who was just about to get Barco with a half-pike. The fort knocks out the corvette's mizzenmast as she comes around and runs for the polycrest, which is now missing her foremast, her main top gallant, and most of her bowsprit. So the polycrest is pretty knocked about here. Despite all of that, Parker reports that all's well, and all of this is fine, apart from, as we say, damage to the rigging and the fact that the barge had sunk beside her. So now, Mike, we're back into seamanship mode. We've cut out the Fanchula. We've got these two boats within range of each other. What are we going to do to take care of the Polycrest? Well, Jack has Parker rig the capstan and make a lane uh, for the cable here. And Jack asks Pullings to take the red cutter under the stern in order to take the line over, only to learn that the red cutter and all their other boats, uh, other than Jack's gig, are destroyed or adrift. So you know, they've kind of lost all the boats. 
Well, Jack asked Pulleys to join him in the gig and bring 20 men because so many men had left to follow Jack that they don't have enough men to, you know, to really man the capstan on the polycrest. As they get to the polycrest, the hands there are reaching eagerly for the line. And Parker wishes Jack joy of his prize in a hesitant voice. In the light of the mortar shells landing closer to the gun brigs than the polycrest, Jack sees that Parker looks like a very, very old, old bent man. I mean, yeah. O'Brien really is kind of underscoring every bit of this. And and I'm wondering to myself if this is part of a reflection of, of Parker's age, but part of a reflection of Parker realizing all the trouble he's caused and that he was left behind because he would have been detrimental, perhaps in death to the mission. And I yeah. suspect a lot of the hands would have you know, taken advantage of that time to make sure that he got fragged in all that fighting, maybe by friendly fire here. So right. I think this is Parker realizing how out of his depth he has been in some ways. Yeah. And this is a bit of a masculinity thing here, I think, going on. Parker's kind of shallow, and you might even say toxic, version of masculinity has been shown for what it is. And as a result, he's left with not very much of his character. Jack Aubrey's own masculinity and manhood has been absolutely reconfirmed by his execution and his decision making and his acts so far in this action but we're not done yet jack calls for the fanchula to heave away once the cable is connected and meanwhile he orders the polycrests to step out heartily on the capstan the gun brigs shear away and meanwhile full saint jack who've now figured out what's what open up with everything they have. They're no longer afraid of hitting their own boats. They want to get the two British crews aboard the Polycrest and the Fanchula. Four men at the capstan bars are killed. The main topmast topples over the forecastle, so this ship is getting really heavily damaged here. Jack kicks a dead body out of the way, grabs a bar for himself, orders heave and rally, and his feet slip on the blood. Even through the sound of the guns, they can hear the ship's bottom shifting over the sand. Then suddenly the capstan turns free and they all fall on their faces, not because they're floating again, but because the fort has fired a shot that has been wildly lucky and cut the cable. Wow. 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 So it's still pretty intense here. Lots of jeopardy for the polycrests and for the fanchula. Yeah, this one, you know, we always think about how this would look on our favourite whoever making the whole canon into, you know, into a television series or a series of movies or something. And I'm, I'm thinking about this one going, man, this is, this is fabulous. Well, Goodrich can't bring the Fanchula alongside because now, you know, it's late, it's too shallow on the ebb and there's no boat to bring the cable back again. Jack, as you said, it's not over with Jack, strips off his clothes, dives in, with the sound of the guns all around him. And as he dives, a jagged piece of iron catches him on the head, sending him deep under. So I think with all this shot falling around and bouncing off, he's gotten tagged, but he makes it to the Corvette and is hauled aboard. So he's made it over, and but there's nobody, he's, he's wounded. There's nobody on the Fanchula who can swim the cable back. Jack says, give me the cable. And Goodrich is worried. He tells Jack, you know, you're bleeding badly from the head, from your sword wound. Can you sit down and have a dram? Jack (laughs) shakes his head no, splatters blood all over the deck when he does so. Goes down the ladder knowing that every second counts. He's thinking there's already six inches less water under the polycrest than there was just a minute ago. So Jack is swimming again. And might we we get this slightly dreamlike thing now of Jack's swim back the other way. He's swimming on his back. He's noticing this flashing, continuous flashing in the sky. He realizes that the constellation Cassiopeia, which should be to his north, is the wrong way about. He realizes that there are two moons, so he's got double vision, and there's water filling his throat. And the realization grows on him that he's tired. His wits are going, and maybe this is Jack Aubrey very near his end. He takes his bearings fresh, He fixes on the ship and concentrates his whole spirit on swimming, plunging with every stroke. But the strokes are feeble against the tide. He changes direction to allow for the current, makes it to the ship, but there's no strength left in his arms to pull himself up. And he orders the men who are trying to bring him aboard to stop fussing and take up the cable immediately. And Mike, besides being a really dramatic bit of first-person action hero stuff for Jack Aubrey, 
We've had a bit of a foreshadowing already of some of these heroics with carrying a cable. Um, Captain Edward Pellew, later Lord Exmouth, um, was famous for doing exactly this kind of operation, but to rescue a person rather than to rescue a whole ship. And by the way, I've tried swimming to carry even a really lightweight line in daylight, in, wa- in warm water, unwounded. And it's really, really difficult. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so th- this is really well-earned action hero stuff from Jack Aubrey. As we've said m- many times, if you've been waiting to get past the shore-based action and into the heroics, then they are right here. And, uh, Mike, before we carry on, uh, I wonder what drove Jack to this point. It may be that this is just regular Jack Aubrey. We we know from the rest of the canon that he has physical courage and decisiveness and confidence in his own ability physically and intellectually to solve a problem. But this is real, you know, putting your neck on the line stuff. This is real last ditch, reckless, you might say, risk taking. And it makes me wonder, he's been feeling kind of numb with dread over like the wreckage of his career, certainly over the forthcoming duel. He said a few paragraphs ago, Stephen Matram may put a hole in me wherever he chooses. So he's kind of resigned and willing to chance his life over almost anything. Would he have had the reckless courage to risk his life with this swimming stunt if he hadn't been at this really, really low ebb? It's kind of interesting to speculate. Mike, it's almost as if everything that's happened so far in the book was just to get him to this point here, huh? Yeah, it is. And, you know, I think his love life also absolute mess. He had Sophie, loved Sophie, blew that with Diana. Diana's gone. He's, you know, kind of, so I think you're right. I mean, this has really put him at a fascinating point in his life here. Yeah. Well, uh, luckily for Jack, some things are still constant, despite how much Jack tries to screw him up. Bonden comes down carries Jack up onto the ship and sits him down on a match tub. So luckily he's got bonded here. The capstan turns slowly. The artillery is firing from the forts and they're holding the ship over and over again. But Jack is now indifferent to the fire. It just seems like background nuisance noise to him. All, you know, further kind of underscore to the point you just made, Ian. Yeah. He even rally, he cries, and throws himself on a bar when the capstan stops. There's a click and a groan, and somebody says, she moves. And then there's wild cheering as they all shout, she swims. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, you know, this last minute thing here. You know, as they surge out heavily into the channel, Jack orders Parker to set every sail they have. Parker can't hear him. He's begging his pardon, but the seamen have heard him and they're all moving immediately. You know, they're obeying. Everybody is doing exactly what it takes. Polycrest has steering way. Jack calls for Goodrich to cut the cable and lead them out by Ras de Pont and veer out a tow line when they're underway. Now, Jack takes the wheel, adjusts for the leeway, and we know how much leeway the Polycrest makes, and realizes that she's heavy and low in the water. With more sail that's being set, she's doing just about two knots, running with the tide. They should be out of range of the forts in 10 minutes. So Jack has the guns put back into place. He sees Parker barely holding himself together and asks Pullings to take the hands forward and pick up the tow line. Mr. Gray reports six feet of water below. The doctor has come to get permission to move the wounded to the captain's cabin, Both the cockpit and the gun room are awash with water. Jack says, can we plug more shot holes and get the pumps going? The carpenter says, I'll do my best, sir. But I fear it's not the shot holes. She's opening like a flower. And Mike, there's there's our second flower simile and a a bookend to go with the white rose simile earlier on. It's beautiful, but it's really, really sad news for the polycrest. We're still in battle, though, that there's a flurry of shot that drowns everyone's words as the fort opens up with glowing red-hot shot, shot that's been in the furnace. Three of them hit the ship. Babington staggers aft. He's got one sleeve hanging empty, which Mike sounds a little bit like a, an image that we all know from the Master and Commander movie, and reports that the tow line has been made fast. Jack says thank you to Babington. He orders the men help Matrin to move the wounded into the cabin, and he realises as he's doing this that he's shouting... But there's no need to, because all the guns except for one are silent now as the moon dips low. 
Jack takes a look ahead at this corvette that he's cut out. Pretty, tall and trim, great strength in the pull as she's towing the polycrest out here. She'll be a fast one, he thinks. And might, almost as quickly as we ran aground, we're miraculously sailing away from this terribly risky action here. Yeah. And they're, they're moving along and they're passing the opening of the Ras de Pont, which is full of transports. Ah. And, you know, all of these transports seem unaware of Fanchula's changed character again. You know, they think she's still their ship. So they're sitting ducks, Jack's thinking. They're the chance of a lifetime. And Jack hollers over to Goodrich. Goodrich says all his guns are prime. They've got plenty of cartridge filled. Jack tells him to lead them through the transports. Now, unfortunately, Jack learns that all the polycrest powder is drowned, but they do have three rounds of shot and shot a plenty. So Jack tells Jenkins to double shot all the guns so they can give them a salute as they pass by. And then Jack laughs, thinking that this is exactly what was in his orders. He's got the Corvette. He's going to blow up these transports here. And then he realizes that he's holding himself up by the wheel and he starts laughing again. So I think, you know, Ian, you, you pointed again and again at Jack's state of mind. He really is. Uh, gosh. He's, he's not entirely connected to reality, but he's euphoric, right? Right. right. Now, the, the transports see what's coming here. They get agitated. Some of them start to move and unmoor. Some of them hail the Fanchula and they set sail. Jack asks Goodridge to back the main topsail to bring the Polycrest to a halt. And the Polycrest shoots up into the wind, closing the distance. Some of the transports now fall afoul of each other, and Jack orders his gun crews to fire as they bear, just as the Fanchula's guns burst into flames and smoke. One transport gets fouled in the Polycrest's remaining shrouds. The commander says he's struck, not realising the Polycrest guns are empty. This is a prize, in actual fact, and as long as they're quick about it, they can do something with it. So Pullings takes possession, and in a half hour, the channel is clear of transports, three grounded, two run ashore, one sunk, and the others doubling back to the outer road or in, right into Cholier, where one of them was set ablaze then by friendly fire, by red-hot shot from the fort. The polycrest, meanwhile, is moving really heavily. The tow line is under strain, and Jack hails Goodrich and the transport to come alongside. Bonden, him again, helps Jack below, helps to confirm the carpenter's desperate diagnosis that the polycrest is not long for this world. He gives orders for the wounded to be moved into the corvette, for the prisoners to be secured, his papers brought, and he sits and watches the tired men carrying their belongings and their shipmates and all their necessities out of the polycrest. Parker and Pullings and Russell come to take Jack across. He says, you go ahead, I'll follow, in the very model of a captain being the last one to leave the ship. Mike, this, this is a very, very chilling moment. Yeah, I've, I've been listening to a podcast this week about the Titanic and about a captain going down with his ship. And this doesn't sound like a great moment for, uh, for Jack Aubrey here. No, I, I always feel the same way. And I got to this and I went, you know, you guys go ahead. I'll follow you. Just a minute ago, he's holding himself up by the wheel, barely. Yeah. Bond is having to carry him down. And I'm going, oh, no, no, no. He's not going to stay on this thing. No, please, no. Oh. Um, and, and I think some of his men are thinking the same thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, Parker and Pullings and Russell, the Texans, they hesitated, caught the earnestness of his tone and look, crossed and stood hovering on the rail of the Corvette. Now the varying breeze blew off the land. The eastern sky was lightning. They were out of the Ras de Pont beyond the shoals, and the water in the offing was a fine, deep blue. He stood up, he, Jack, stood up, walked as straight as he could to a ruined gun port, made a feeble spring that just carried him to the Fanchula, staggered, and turned to look at his ship. She did not sink for a good ten minutes, and by then the blood, what little he had left, had made a pull at his feet. She went very gently, with a sigh of air rushing through the hatches, and settled on the bottom, the tips of her broken masts showing a foot above the surface. Come, brother, said Stephen in his ear, very like a dream. Come below. You must come below. 
Here is too much blood altogether. Below, below. Here, Bonded, carry him with me. End of chapter 11. Ah. It's, it's one of the great, great moments in the canon. And we'll talk in a second about how it's been kind of concealed and brought to us and what it really means. But I, I, it, it gets both of us every time. I, I think that's a really hard paragraph to read with a dry eye. <laughs> oh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> oh, and by, it, it's funny, been paying so much close attention to this chapter for this reread, kind of knowing and relishing the the connection between Jack and Stephen and what they're doing for each other. I'm really struck by how carefully Bonden has been written into every critical moment with Jack. You, you know, you're so right, Ian. You're so right. And I, I was so focused on Jack and Stephen, yeah. I was missing this Bonden, 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 Bonden all the way through here. Which is, I mean, a, apart from being a, a really nice reminder that there are other characters in this story be besides Jack and Stephen, this is not a bromance. This is a story of the Royal Navy family. It's also great that, like, a Bonden was thrown in the barge with the mutineers back at the beginning of the chapter, and we're all going to be big Bonden fans, not very much further on into this canon, all the way through this canon. Uh, and it's nice that we all get reminded that Bonden is absolutely by his captain's side, and he's absolutely playing the role that we want him to play. But wow, Mike, what a, what a moment. It's hard to remember sometimes, here as we are having done our read of the whole canon and then come back again, so many of us circumnavigating and reading this again know what the import of this is for the friendship and the arc that follows it. If you're only in your second Patrick O'Brien book, like relish this moment, like take it in. This is the foundation, I think, of the of the friendship and the story that's going to come. Right, and, and I remember, in, you know, fr back the first time I read this, um, you know, it relieved so much tension for me. But I still saw it as just a glimmer of hope for their relationship. Yeah. But, but that was everything for me because I thought, this is Patrick O'Brien. And things don't always go the way I think they're going to go. This is not written like a, you know, like a, a, a wildly commercial author writes, you know, sort of recipe books or something. Yeah. And it's written so carefully and with a, such an understated style that like so, some readers have taken it amiss, I would say. Not very many of us, but if you go into any of the online discussions, there are, there are things that people have reservations about when it comes to post captain. People have reservations about the bear suit. People have reservations about the amount of shore based Jane Austen romance with a small R that's going on, and they having to have reservations about this moment. Like, hold on a second, is this is this the moment that? the duel and the challenge and the friendship is all resolved. What, why haven't we had them in a, in a room together, you know, bashing it out and having the big, uh, the big argument or the big reconciliation. And I think it's, it's perfectly reasonable as a reader to want to be with them. The moment that they both know for sure that it's all okay. It's really clever, really confident. Uh, you might even say really hubristic writing by O'Brien to say, I'm going to trust you and me reader and author together. We're going to see what's happening here. Yeah, so so very true, and you know, so very true. We spoke a couple of episodes ago about how all the writing between Stephen and Jack in the previous couple of chapters is laying foundations, and that because the foundations are strong, we get very little of the surface decoration. This is the moment. This phrase here is too much blood taken below. Ha! Ah, this is a really tiny sign on the surface of what's happening with the foundations of this friendship. And yeah. and, uh, and I love it's great. You know, Ian, as you're saying, you know kind of O'Brien's built these foundations and, and now it really pays off. And I love how that payoff is not with a big bang, right? right. but almost a dreamlike soothing, this quiet voice here. I just, I just love that here. Yeah, yeah. And is, if he, he mentioned it explicitly at the end, it'd be, be, it being dreamlike. But if you go back and look at the whole chapter, in fact, at least half of this book has been written in this slightly dissociated, disoriented voice for either of our two heroes. And there's a dreamlike quality to a huge amount of what happens. Uh, in post chapter, yeah. and I think that's also one of the reasons why some people might find it hard to relate to if you're looking for a traditional adventure story. This is written like a mid twentieth century literary novel, rather right. than a home blower. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. You know, and and um, 
I love the way how, you know, we talked before how we felt like maybe O'Brien was really taking this canon and making it his own yeah. after after he got the green light for Post Captain. So how, you know, our two heroes and, and others have really defined their true characters in this chapter, in this book up until now, in this chapter. And, uh, you know, looking at what's happened since they both learned about their tr the, the truth about their different relationships with Diana yeah. and the role that, you know, we've got all these pe moving pieces in their lives here. So, you know, for those folks who don't like the Jane Austen and don't like Ashore, I'm thinking, boy, for me, that is so much of the richness of what's going on with this, again, O'Brien talking about human nature and how people behave and, and do things for us. And, and, and I'm certainly hoping that given what they've learned about Diana now that you know, for them to press on with this duel would be a, a, you know a little bit pointless or senseless. But right. this is O'Brien, so you never know what, what's going to happen here. Right, right, right. Oh I mean, gosh. again, we're, we're early in the canon. There's a version. There's the ideal version of Jack and Stephen. Um, you might say the Socratic ideal of Jack right, and Stephen right. that has that has refound, reforged its friendship in this moment here at the end of this chapter. But they yeah. created versions of themselves that that needed this duel to pay off all their kind of jealousies and anxieties and posturing. And yeah. like, we don't know in book two, whether the quarrelsome posturing teenager size of their characters are going to stick around or whether we're going to have the mature men um, to, to move forward within the rest of the books. It's a really fascinating question. It is a fascinating question. And thank goodness that we have years and years and years of development to enjoy along that way here. Yeah, yeah. But we've got now, you know, you were mentioning, Ian, that some people, you know, have their issues with this book. And, and I would hope that if, if, you know, some of you listeners are the folks that were saying, you know, I want to see a lot more action and not all this domestic time ashore. Well, here, here was a fabulous chapter for you, right? Yep. You know, Hart sent them to their deaths. Uh, and, and given, you know, given the polytrust condition, given the crew, given what would be required to win this action in this kind of port. And true to that prediction, you know, the polycrest is dead. Yeah. But Jack's not dead. The crew's not dead, at least not all of them, although I suspect there's a high butcher's bill. Yeah. And the mission is certainly not dead. You know, I think they succeeded beyond anyone's wildest dreams uh, and, and perhaps beyond Hart's wildest desire. <laughs> he, he, really, you know, he would have liked to see the polycrest dead and maybe everybody with him. I don't know here. So, I, you know, I'm kind of thinking, though, all right, this has happened there's still life ashore. Yeah. Jack and Sophie still seem to be at a stalemate. Stephen and Diana, perhaps maybe a thing of the past now. Debtors still waiting ashore. Doesn't matter how big a hero is. The more the publicity comes back, the more they're going to be looking for him. Yeah. Hart may be pleased that at least he finally got a prize this time, but I think we're way beyond that. And perhaps, I don't know, will he be mad that Jack succeeded? Uh, will he hold the loss of the ship against him? We remember at the end of Master and Commander, that was a moment of, you know, you lost your ship. Let's go to the court martial. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Um, speaking of which, like we remember from the original conversation between Lord Melville, the First Lord, and Jack, that there are really not that many ships around to be had. And maybe one little glimmer of hope for Jack, if he wants a ship, um, is that he's just found his own. Like maybe the F Fanchula could be brought into the service. A 20 guns, I don't know if she rates a post-captain, but that's an open question. Yeah, per the title of this book, post-captain, yeah. we're still wondering, does it rate the title of this book? Right. So it's a, great, it's a great question. I love that. That's a great point. And uh, Mike, for all we have reflected on this last paragraph of this chapter, and said, we think we know now what's going on with the friendship between Jack and Stephen. We still haven't really heard. It wouldn't be unusual for O'Brien to suddenly zip forward in the timeline and tell us something in reported speech looking backwards. So it would be really fascinating to find out where Jack and Stephen stand with each other. Because even if they're reconciled as friends, they've said and done some things in public that still have some consequences. Um, many people have been unwilling or unable to get out of their own way, particularly Jack and Stephen, but other people as well. Um, this desire to bow to social conventions, the desire to save face, the desire to avoid a rejection, you know, all these kind of self-defeating, self-destructive social pretenses that get in the way. Mike, there's a huge amount more to read about and we are not 
at the end of this book? I think Ian, there's just one way to find out. What do you say next week to a little bit more Patrick O'Brien? With all my heart. Asks. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God. No, I thought I corrected no, say, that. Jackass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jackass. He is a jackass. There you go. There's... <laughs> Very good, Sam. <laughs> <clears throat> Take two. <Sorry>. Jack. <laughs> Sorry.